All right. Hey, everybody. Andy Sachs here with Coldwell Banker and the Roundtown team. But as I say every week now in our third installment of our New Town Leaders Forum, I am but your humble moderator. And I apologize. We we're recording this one. We were having technical difficulties and could not go live. And we were really excited and still are excited. We have a great panel. Uh, Stephanie. Stephanie is the founder and current director of the Newtown Resiliency Center, correct? Correct. Welcome. And Stephanie, give us, I'm going to open with this, and I didn't tell you this one, I'm going to spring on all of you. Tonight's topic is about resiliency. And I think everyone defines it a little bit differently, but I'm going to go, as I introduce each of you, Stephanie, give me your definition of what resiliency is in today's world. So resiliency is a way we start to look at how are we going to come back from events in our life that maybe take us away from our normal way of being, whether it is a traumatic event, a loss, in this case, a pandemic. What are we going to do for, to advance ourselves and continue to grow as we go through life and figure out our new normal? This pandemic is definitely going to be a new normal for most all of us and impacts every single person, no matter what we come from and where, what our background is. We are all having to shift and change. So being resilient is going to be, how are we going to handle it now? And once we get back to new normal, what is that going to look like for each of us? And how are we going to change and what growth we're going to have to come back? Awesome. Thank you, Stephanie. Yes, Stephanie Sink, by the way, living down in Tampa, but deep roots still here in Newtown and leading the Resiliency Center. Thank you for being here. My next guest, John Woodall. John, you've got too many credentials for me to list at this time, but if you, if you could give me a brief introduction and kind of your definition of resiliency at this time in our lives. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, resiliency, as you mentioned, has had a lot of definitions over the years. More and more, I'm thinking of resiliency as transformation, that there really is no going back to normal. Because for most people, what's normal anyway? Uh, normal isn't all that good for a lot of people to begin with. But it, it really has to do with bringing out qualities you didn't know you had, uh, growing. So how do you do that in a healthy way that joins you with other people so that you can maintain a vision for your life unfold more and more capacity, be motivated to do that, and do that in, a, in a, a, an expanding and nurturing community. So in, in a nutshell, those are the features of resilience. Thank you, John. Appreciate it. Thank you for being with us. Scott Ruzak. Scott is a sergeant on our police force, and uh, by virtue of the experiences of Newtown, has also become a very well-versed trainer and educator in resiliency training. Scott, Thanks for joining us, man. What are your thoughts on what resiliency means today? Thank you for having me. Uh, I would, so I would simplify resiliency as the science of recovery. It, whether you're recovering from a global pandemic or a car accident, you wanna to recover to your baseline, uh, whether that is a slower heart rate, uh, less cortisol being dumped into your bloodstream. Resiliency is getting back to a more normal for you uh, basis. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I'll turn it over to Scott Anders. Scott is the uh, current uh, leader of the Chamber of Commerce here in Newtown. Scott, over to you for a quick introduction. Okay, thanks, Andy, and appreciate you hosting these things and helping be uh, impetus for, for getting things going. Again, the, the, the impetus for this is really to reestablish communications. You know, I have a military background, and, and so you know, in crisis, everybody tends to go to ground and, and communication shuts down and, and you lose a sense of teamwork and being part of something bigger than yourself. And that really fundamentally changes everything. So using technology and, and uh, with a little hiccup today, but using technology, we can reconnect uh, and people can see each other, which I think is a big part um, of, you know, we, there's lots of conference calls, there's lots of information that's flowing one way. Uh, using this medium, we can see each other, we can see familiar faces and gain confidence in that, hear from our local leaders and our trusted resources that are local that uh, should give us confidence that, hey, you know, it may be crazy and I'm in an insular world right now, but boy, there's people out there working on this that are really smart, that are interested in, in my well-being. And, uh, and that really is the, the, the gist of the whole program. Thank you, Scott. 
And Dan, for a brief intro, Dan Rosenthal, our first selectman. Thank you, Andy. And uh, again, my thanks to you, to the uh, Chamber of Commerce and to the Newtown B for, uh, for sponsoring these. Mm -hmm. This is now the third one that I've had the pleasure of participating in. And, you know, I think when we talk about resiliency, I think these are the type of things that help build that. You know, I think that it's been important for people that have had the opportunity to watch these to see folks that they identify with in the community and all the folks on the panel today are certainly identified and, and, and trusted folks. And, you know, the folks that have been on the panels in, in, the, in prior weeks. I think seeing people um, and kind of seeing that they're going through sort of similar things and how they're adapting to it and everything, I think helps to build resiliency in people. And from where I sit, I see a very resilient community, the way people are helping one another and responding to this. Um, it's been five long weeks of uh, the social distancing process and a total disruption in our, in our daily routines. I see hopeful signs and I think we're, you know, should I be so bold as to say, I think we're closer to the end than the beginning. I mean, I think that there's gonna be a modification to our lifestyles for a long time to come, but I do think that there's some hopeful signs that maybe we can get back to some normalcy sooner rather than later. Um, and again, I think that's because everybody sort of rolled up their sleeves and did this for the good of everybody. And, and I think it's paying off. So I think these things are incredibly important and I'm happy to be a part of it again today. Thanks, Dan. So guys, I think the overarching goal of tonight, in my humble opinion, is that we leave whoever decides to watch this with something tangible to take away. Um, so Stephanie, I'd like to start with you. Uh, it seems there are two levels of resiliency for us. And again, these questions are written by Scott Anders and I. Um, so they're coming from really from a layman's point of view. And, and we're looking to hopefully you guys shed some light on it. So it seems that there are two levels of resiliency for us to confront. One emotional level, dealing with feelings, attitudes, and motivations. And the other on the physical level, dealing with specific issues with finances and education, and jobs, and families. What are, what are some strategies or how do we, I don't know if compartmentalize or how do we approach all of this? Because it's all coming at us at once. What are some initial strategies we can do to kind of um, get some perspective on it? Yeah, and I think you make a good point. There's so much coming at everyone all at once right now. It's really, people are finding it really hard to separate and decide what am I gonna kind of attack and try to deal with today or at the moment. And then on top of that, you know, we also have many families who are homeschooling or got kids at home and trying to figure out there's not gonna be camps. So that you also have the what ifs and the anxiety continues to grow as we have so much unknown still out there, creating a lot of fear as someone mentioned before. You know, and I always related to relationships heal people and connection. And when you're feeling overwhelmed and in crisis, the human nature is to turn to others, to ask for help and to come together and surround you with support and love to help you through that difficult time. Unfortunately now with so many people being isolated and social distancing, we're trying to figure out and are trying to encourage people to physically distance but not socially distance yourself because we need just as humans to have those social interactions to help our minds not get caught up in the, what am I going to do? How I'm not sleeping well. I'm tired. My job, watching the stock market, watching the news wheel repeat itself all day with the numbers going up. You have to wear a mask. Do I have a mask? I only wear a mask once. You can't get masks. You know, there's no milk at the grocery store. And, trying to control that in some way and to figure out, okay, if I can't, and I see this in Newtown and around everywhere, but I've seen it well, great job, Dan, and everyone in Newtown are trying to come together, whether it's a kid's birthday party and they're having parades down the street or dropping off goodie bags at somebody's house or if somebody knows another family member sick in a house, restaurants, making sure they have food. So trying to still keep that social connection in relationships to help deviate from some of those stressors that we have every day that surround us. And we all know when you're isolated and alone and in your house and not getting out, the mind does crazy things and can quickly get you into the wheel that you, hamster wheel that you wanna to try to get out of. So I really encourage people as we continue on this, and it will be a new normal as Dan just mentioned, figuring out ways to have strong social connections as we move forward. 
in just a different way. And this is one of them, you know, we're not sitting next to each other and we're all Zooming now and it's maybe not ideal, but it's a great way to still get the word out and to see everybody. John, how about your thoughts? So I think Stephanie hit some really important points. Uh, and the need for human connection is, is one of the most fundamental things that's challenged in a time like this. And, and, and very simplistically, what happens when we get uh, overwhelmed uh, is we have a natural instinct to contract our sense of who we are. Uh, you know, it can go from being a, a human to an American to a Republican or Democrat to a whatever religion to your own family. And then even in your own family, you can feel completely isolated from people in the house. Maybe you don't want to overwhelm them with what you're going through, or maybe you would notice your spouse is becoming more distant. So people tend to kind of shrink and drift apart from each other. Um, sometimes exactly because they've lost their sense of knowing how to connect again, like Stephanie was saying. So those are yellow flags. Those, those, we, we should use those as little, well, even red flags, that there's an opportunity afoot, that we, our instinct is to go this way with our identity. But what we have to make a conscious choice uh, in our lives, when, we're, when we notice we're contracting, we need to make a choice to go the other way. So I call that an invitation for intimacy or an invitation for becoming closer. So start to notice that, that, you know what, I've spent this whole last, the whole afternoon in this room by myself on Facebook. You know, I need to connect with my kid. I need to, you know, reach out to my spouse. I need to like look them in the eye and, and find something about them that I love and talk to them about it. Just these little kind of islands of sanity and connection throughout the day, having one or two of those can ground you so that when you're dealing with the step, the thing Stephanie was talking about, you're not just spinning out of control for farther and farther uh, away from your own kind of personal center. So uh, it, just to amplify some of the things Stephanie's talking about, maybe Scott's got some uh, ideas as well. That's, that's really well said. I've got some follow-up questions I'll get to later. Scott, any thoughts on that on kind of the day-to-day -day and, and you know, how to these couple different pathways of um, emotional stress, of, of stress that we can battle? So so yeah, I, I would agree with Stephanie and uh, John in that social connections can't be overestimated. They're, they're absolutely vital to your happiness and vital to a long life. There's a 75 year study done by Harvard that shows that social connections are a greater predictor of long life than your body mass index, than your diet, than whether you even smoked. So it's more important that you have strong social connections, strong friendships. But I, I, I was more interested in an earlier part of your question where uh, you, you talked about uh, emotional stress and physical stress. And the reality is, is that thinking is a biological event and thinking about stressful events will cause you stress, will cause changes in your body. So if you spend 23 out of the 24 hours watching news network, you're going to, you're going to put your body artificially in the stress response. And that is absolutely unhealthy. Can I build on that for a second? That, that's a really important point. Please, John. So uh, the way we focus is, is really critical. It's an a, a extremely important point. Um, let's see where I want to go with there. There's a, like a million ways to go with that. Um, if we're not conscious of what we're putting into our brain, we're in a constant state of hyper arousal is what uh, psychiatrists call it, where we're, we're seeing the world through a lens of threat. So wh whatever emotion we have at that time, whether it's fear or anger, uh, everything that we perceive through that emotional lens, it just gets amplified. And so we start, we, we, we see the world as a scary place. And we even, the, the way our brain stores memories is according to the emotions that we had at the time we had that uh, experience. So if we're, if we're viewing the world through an emotional lens of fear, all we can think of are fearful memories. And so everything is just amplifying more and more fear. And then that clouds our ability to solve problems and to feel in control. The biggest thing that happens when we flood ourselves with this social media of negativity is we feel more and more out of control. And it, it, feeling out of control is what generates anxiety. So we get in these vicious cycles. So Scott's point is extremely important to consciously stop 
the, the negative input but with things we have no control over and find something we have control over. And as Stephanie said, that's most intimately somebody we love, just connecting in some way, texting a friend. You know, uh, I, I think that we start really with our family, um, but just noticing when we're getting out of control and doing a little assessment. What am I letting into my thinking that's making me feel out of control? And what can I do right now to ground myself in something that is uh, deepening my connection with another human being and a couple other things. Strengthening my sense of purpose in my life. You know, if, if you're a parent, you know, what, what am I doing to keep my family healthy? Or, or what am I doing to deepen my relationships? And then personally, what capacities am I using to, mm -hmm. towards that goal, right? And then the third thing is, what am I doing with my motivation? Am I, am I, am I paralyzing myself with anxiety? What am I doing to nurture my motivation? And all of that to create that sense of connection. So again, all of that building on what Scott just said about being really sensitive to what we're letting into our, our consciousness. It's great. Um, okay, so, so what comes to mind when I hear these things, obviously it's all, I think we can all relate on some level, right? No matter how stable your home life is, no how many, how, how well connected you are outside or not, someone can draw some kind of like, yeah, that, um, um, uh, aha, uh, an aha thought that says, yeah, that's, that, I, I can relate to that. But how do you, I guess, how do you break that cycle, right? What are, what are some tips, I don't want to say tricks, but what are some tips to breaking that cycle of not picking up, you know, we all go robot, we go phone, that, that look at, you know, news, stock market, whatever it might be. What are some triggers that we can employ on a real basic level to start breaking that cycle? Steph, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. So, you know, I've been telling people, pick a time every day. Mm -hmm. You know, when I wake up, I'm going to check something for a half hour when I have coffee. I'll go back at lunch break. And so make concrete schedule of when you're going to allow yourself to look at the phone or turn on the TV mm -hmm. or check the stock market instead of constantly allowing it to refresh every time you go on. And we, unfortunately, as a society, we've been trained to do that in meetings, even before the pandemic, constantly checking, constantly checking. And now it's gotten worse because we have a lot more time at home and we can have the ability to do that. I've also been encouraging everyone to try to check in with one person a day. Just whether it's a text like Dr. Woodall said, or a phone call or an email. Hey, just wanna let you know, I'm thinking about you, how's it going for you? Mm -hmm. It's again, trying to, that social connection, connecting with someone you may have not talked to in a while. You don't know what someone's going through. Even, you know, every, some people have some stable lives. Other people were in tough situations prior. And then obviously this is bringing up all being home. And we don't know. And it's hard to really see that if they were going to work every day or they were going to school or they were missing classes or they were calling out sick for work we don't have that indicator anymore. So I think it's even more important now that everyone takes some time to check in with someone that they know. Great. Scott, any thoughts on that? And kind of, I feel like you and I have had conversations in the past. There's kind of things you can do in the, the that, that immediate notion or the immediate time to kind of calm yourself or find that. Challenge. Sure. I mean, obviously the, your three basics, which is your diet, exercise, sleep, but then you can do some deep breathing exercises. Anytime you're feeling like you're uh, getting a little spun out of control, anytime you're feeling like your anxiety is ramping up, some deep breathing exercises with your uh, eyes open, just counting your breaths, counting uh, how long you take to breathe in, holding your breath and then breathing out. All of that will help to oxygenate your blood, will help you to think more clearly. And of course, if you're thinking clearly, you're making better decisions. When you're making good decisions, that's when you're happier with life, right? Um, so anything you can do to be more present, it's, it's very difficult to do with a f cell phone in one hand, an iPad in another, and the remote control, you know, at your feet. So turning off all those, giving yourself a break is really what you need to look out to do. Dr. Woodall. Yeah, uh, I completely agree. One thing I've noticed with my patients, I, I, I have a stack of uh, charts over there from my I brought in from my office. I've seen about a hundred people in the last week and a half and uh, all but one 
it has uh, experienced what we call a phase shift in their sleep, where instead of going to bed at 10, 11, 12, they're going to bed at two, three, and four. Uh, it, and it's precisely what uh, Scott and Stephanie just talked about. They, they've lost what the Germans called their Zeitgebirs, their timekeepers. So uh, the, all the daily structured things, not eating at the same time, not going to bed at the same time, not having the routines of work. So the, 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 the hypothalamus actually shifts and you start going to sleep later and later. So that, uh, and that has terrible consequences on our health over time. It, it makes us uh, much more uh, prone to uh, becoming anxious, much less uh, able to keep our thoughts clear that that brain fog sets in where everything seems a little bit overwhelming and hard to figure out we're just like we feel like we're two steps behind everything so as Stephanie said setting times to do things routinely and uh, um, I, I would suggest for most people it's hard to um, uh, set um, those timekeepers well uh, let me say it this way uh, if you can start with going to bed and waking up time, although I think that's the hardest one, that's the best one, but the hardest one. The next one is setting at least two meals, breakfast, and dinner, lunch and dinner, if you're getting up late, or at least two activities. And it's better to be two, it's like Scott was saying, if it's exercise, taking a walk, calling somebody, but at a set time so that your brain knows that you, what if it's day or night, I, I just had to ask my, my, my son to go outside and walk around the yard just to, so that his body knew that it was daytime. Uh, uh, so we're working on that in the house. So uh, routine is really important for the brain. Um, if you're noticing you have a lot of brain fog, it, brain fog that is the name of that kind of fogginess where you just don't feel kind of that you're with it like you usually are, that's almost... Uh, uh, that's not entirely, but largely a, a, a faculty of poor sleep. So paying attention to your sleep is really important. Can, can these can these traits and skills be taught? Right? Is it, it, what is you know? You know, I think I think everything you guys have said. I think we've we we, we would all agree upon. But how hard is it? Is it really? I mean, it's, it's got to be a commitment. I assume, right? It's got to be a commitment to make that change, to make that stance. Scott, what are your thoughts? I mean, of, of the officer, absolutely. How, what, how are people able to adapt this into their daily life? Absolutely. You, you know, obvi obviously, some people will adapt better than others. Everybody has their doctor tell them they should eat right and they should get enough sleep and they should quit smoking. Right. Not everybody listens, right? Everybody can be taught that you need to think about your reaction and when you have a critical incident or you have something that causes you anxiety. Think about how you reacted to that, and then how do you want to react in the future? Your initial reaction may still be the same. You may still fly off the handle, but thinking about how you flew off the handle so that it doesn't happen the next time is a very adaptable uh, perspective, right? Get, getting, uh, improving your, your lifestyle is a very adaptable perspective. So all of this is very teachable and, and very learnable for, for most people. Stephanie, at the Resiliency Center, how would you guys implement this? There are these type of skills to folks as they come through. How are you guys teaching this? So in this case, we would really sit down with them and do a schedule. What is your day going to look like? Let's mark it down. What works for you? What time do you have to be at school? Or what time do you have to be at work? What are your meetings? Are you working at Starbucks and you have the 5 a.m. opening? Or do you have the 2 p.m. opening? and then creating it with them as a guide for them to follow. So you hopefully empower them to have the skills that they need to really make the effort to follow the schedule and the routine. Because it is gonna take effort. No one on this panel I think is saying it's easy to do when everything's going on around us. Mm -hmm. So you've gotta really want to make the change and ask for the help to get there. Yeah. yeah. You know, if, if I could add to these important points, that I, my career has been very unusual. I, I, I worked in, and had the opportunity to witness uh, profound tragedies, uh, uh, genocides in Bosnia and Uganda. Uh, I worked with the mayor's office to develop the resilience response in the city. Um, after Katrina, I, I ran the program. Uh, you, you mentioned, Scott, that 70-year study. That was George Valent. He was one of my colleagues at Harvard. So um, uh, I ran the 
Resilient Responses to Social Crisis program at Harvard. So, and I say that for this reason, that we're only discovering something that all of history has known. I mean, just because a scientist says it doesn't mean that these are new skills. These are things humans have done as long as there's been humans. Uh, all the great wisdom traditions talk about some form of resilience, some form of transformation or overcoming. It's what humans do. All the great movies, all the great books, they're about overcoming. So, and we do, I don't really think we go back to a norm. Uh, our physiologically, our, our, our blood pressure might normalize, our heart rate might normalize, but who we are as humans grows or shrinks. Uh, so it's about growth. It's about how do we grow? How do we suffer successfully? How do we become more of a human being, a better human being? And I, I think the biggest obstacle to that is fear, is fear that, that we see the change that we're experiencing or, or the disruption, the uncertainty that we're experiencing as causing a destruction of who we are. That, and, and we become afraid of that. So we become afraid to move into a new self, a bigger self. <clears throat> it's like the, when you're teaching your child how to swim, you know, they're terrified, at, or a lot of kids, terrified at first, but once they get the hang of it, you can't get them out of the water. So humans are like that. We, it, it's, but that first stage of overcoming the fear, and I think that th there's, a, there's a quality of being able to kind of surrender to the change, to uh, that we're moving away from the surface of who we are into something much deeper, into the rest of that ocean of, who we are. So uh, that's a philosophical point. You, you, you had a comment called suffer successfully. Did I hear that yeah. correctly? So I was in Israel once many years ago and two of my heroes lived there at the time. And uh, I, I, I was invited to dinner by one of them. And uh, the other one happened to say to me, oh, John, what are you doing tonight? And I said, oh, well, Dr. Rue uh, invited me to dinner. And he said, ah, Dr. Rue, there is a man who has suffered successfully. It completely blew my mind. I thought, you mean you can suffer successfully? Well, then what would unsuccessful suffering look like? It really changed my, that was a seminal event in my life, 1988. Um, and so that was essentially talking about resilience. It was a man who uh, took the terrible challenges in his life and turned them into opportunities for growth. So it sounds like a Hallmark card. But if you go to Uganda or war zones, you, you find people who really become transformed and they become humbler and they become more compassionate, they become bigger. Um, and, but there may be nothing, their life is nothing like what it was before the, the, the tragedy. So this is the human condition. And I, I don't wanna over pathologize it and say that this struggle is some kind of weakness on our part or that even sadness or uncertainty or anxiety are always bad. Sometimes they're unavoidable. But if they're paralyzing and prevent us from growing, then maybe we need some help. We can turn to uh, the loved ones in our lives and, and get some nurturance. And if it's severe, seek out professional help or, or clergy or, or, or someone who we trust. But I, I, I don't want to leave the impression that resilience is the, the, the purview of people with degrees and, and uh, who've gone to universities. It's, it's what humans do. It's, it's, part of, it's part of our nature. It's part of our nature. Scott, you, you, you and I have talked offline you know, a bunch of times in the past, and you had mentioned something at one point that the body feels stress the same way, um, kind of regardless of the event. And so I'm, I'm paraphrasing and probably mashing that up really horribly, um, but kind of feeding off of, of uh, Dr. Woodall's thoughts like, you know, it, we're not, unfortunately, fortunately, we're not witnessing uh, a war-torn country or things like that, but our bodies still react in such a way that this feels horrible right now, right? So, it, it's, right. Again, you know, am I, am I capturing that correctly? Yeah, it, whether you're in the stress response because you can't pay your bills or the stress response because uh, your wife is leaving you or the stress response because you're going to uh, an officer down call right? Yeah. It doesn't make any difference. Your body is going to react the same way. It, it is, your heart rate is going to go, go up. Your hands are going to get sweaty. But also, we have to keep in mind that sometimes watching the news can put us in a stress response. Sometimes talking to our spouse about our 
daughter's grade is going to put us in the stress response. And what we have to recognize is there are times that we're not going to be able to avoid it. And there are going to be times that we do it out of nonsensical reasoning. And we're going to play over and ruminate about a conversation that we had. And that's causing us stress unnecessarily. Watching the news unnecessarily or ad nauseum, right? After about 15 minutes, you've heard everything they're going to say for the next six hours. Um, going re repeatedly putting yourself in the in the, in the stress response unnecessarily is something we need to avoid got it um, I, I also would like to add that we have to be mindful that this is very similar to a grieving process for a lot of people and i had someone say to me every day it's like a new loss for somebody in my house it was first you know my daughter's a senior and they aren't going to be a may might not have a graduation and get to go to their prom then it was my son's about to start his an email today that that's no longer going to happen. My husband just found out he's going to get a salary cut. So there's a lot of and that is very understandable and a real thing. And so I think we have to also acknowledge that and accept that, that people are grieving a lot of losses unexpectedly, adults and children, you know, whether it's they're not going to summer camp or they look forward to every year to see their best friends. And it's the one thing that gets them through the school year. And now they're told they can't do that. Okay. And being mindful that that's okay. And to process that grief appropriately. And I think as Dr. Woodall said, you know, but if you can't live, laugh or love, and those daily functions aren't happening to make sure you really reach out to clergy or some professional help, a therapist or somebody. Definitely don't be afraid to get help, that's for sure. Can I add to that? That's, it, again, these are uh, really important points. Uh, grief is really a form of love. Something that we've really attached our affections to that has been taken from us. So the, really the task of grief is finding another form for the love. Right, so, and, and so that ties it into what's your purpose? Where, where, where are you directing your life's energies? One of the critical things that I think people can do right now, especially parents with their teens or their kids, is help them with their sense of, what I call it, their sense of capacity. And, and this is something just as simple as uh, noticing and naming, really important, a strength that you see them demonstrating. You know, they're playing video games and, and they actually take the garbage out when you ask them to, you know, uh, or they, whatever it is that they do that is right in the moment where you see a quality of strength of some kind or kindness or connection or humor or whatever it might be to right in that moment say, you know, that's the kind of person you are. You're a strong, you're a, you're strong because you were just kind to your sister, even though you're frustrated or, you know, I'd ask you to take out the garbage even though you're in the middle of call of duty or whatever it is but but commenting on a strength right at that moment is critical for a child in times like this because they lose a sense of their own capacity with so many external things that are being spun around out of control they begin to feel out of control and lose a sense of capacity so we have to kind of help them and remind them of their capacities their strengths that 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 character that they're growing into so not only noticing it, but naming it is extremely important. Then if you can say, and that's valuable because, then they'll kind of remember it. So if you say, wow, the way you were just nice to your sister, that took a lot of guts on your part because she was just mean to you about an hour ago. And that tells me you're going to be a, a good man. Because, something like that. It might sound a little corny of the way I just said it. But the point is to recognize a strength, name it, and talk about its value. And even when you're not in a, a, a traumatic or stressful situation, that's, that's the hallmark of good parenting and bringing up a, a child who has a sense of capacity. Um, and that's, I think, one of the things that's being challenged right now with our young people. The, the other thing to add to that is if you can link that sense of capacity to a goal, to a life goal, and, and you know, something that says something like, and therefore you're going to be a world changer. You know, that's the kind of strength that a person who really has an effect in the world, that's the kind of strength they have to have. So you link the, the, the strength to a vision 
And that's what generates motivation. Does that make sense? It, it, it does. And, and John, from my perspective, um, as a parent, that is also a sense of normalcy for me that I can give to them being right. just like a regular day, right? I'm looking exactly. for that. And then that gives, that gives me that self-worth also and that connection yep. that kind of everyone's talking about as well. So it kind of yep. all feeds itself, it, just from my perspective. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, Stephanie, you talked about loss every day. And it was a really interesting perspective. I had not looked at it that way, but it's, it's, it's 100% true. And, and, and Dan, at the beginning of this, talked about how it looks like you know, things are getting a little bit better. Maybe we're flattening the curve. But we are still a long way from, um, I don't want to use the word normal anymore, John, um, but whatever that's going to be, right? Um, and maybe a sense of security, another sense of security where things are okay again. What are some of the resources people can access? Because for a lot of people, this, the, the, the virus might not get worse, but their circumstances might get worse in the moment. Um, you know, in, in that, you, know, you look back 10 years and they say, wow, that was a really crummy six month period, right? But while you're in it, it feels like the 10 years. So what, what, are, what are the services as other people's circumstances kind of get worse that they can call upon to get through and implement these skills you guys are talking about tonight? So I can say, especially now that I've had some experience down south, that Newtown is very rich in resources. And so people are extremely lucky to have so many resources available to them in Newtown. You know, Dan has done a great job of building a social services, human services team and network. So there's a ton of information now on the town website to lead people to different providers in town, different agencies. Um, the clergy are very involved. On a more global level, you know, SAMHSA has put up some great information in the 24-7 hotline if people just want to call someone who's not local and some okay, people what is, what is SAMHSA? So that's substance abuse and mental health. So it's S-A-M-S-H-A and I can send you .org and they have a 24-7 hotline now. The Child Mind Institute out of New York City has also great articles to help parents navigate during difficult times or how to speak to children, especially younger children. Um, if, again, if they want bigger stuff outside of Newtown, CDC. However, like I've said, Newtown has a ton of great agencies, big agencies, organizations that can help, as well as many, many wonderful private practitioners who are all still working. It is a different way of seeking help during this time, doing telehealth and phone calls versus in person. But I think just like your pediatrician or your physician, that's just becoming the way of the future and how it's gonna be done. So even though it may be uncomfortable at first, everyone's still operating for the most part in Newtown and around to help in any capacity they want. So I really encourage people to use those resources in town and to look to the town's website. There's a lot of resources on that as well through the human services. So check on your neighbors. If you're feeling okay, check on somebody else. I think I heard you guys talk about as well. Yes, make yeah. a check in every day with someone. Check in every day. That was, yeah, I love that. On, we, we, on that we, topic, Andy, uh, last year about this time, we finally rolled out our need help brochure uh, can you see that correct? And that was a, an initiative with the town and uh, the chamber and sponsored by Newtown Savings Bank and a, and a lot of small businesses in town. Uh, but it was, uh, we worked with the Resiliency Center, we worked with uh, Kevin's Community Center, a lot of the local resources to put together a just-in-time, uh, basically quick phone resource where you can call different numbers 24-7, and or go see somebody locally. So um, I think Helen at the chamber is posting this uh, PDF. It was uh, sent out with the town's help to every household in uh, Newtown, I believe it was last June. Um, but uh, we can share the PDF and, and have that posted on a lot of different uh, Facebook pages for other people to tap into. We, we absolutely can. And also a lot of the people who will view this will not be necessarily from town, but from the surrounding area. And so Stephanie put up a lot of great air places people can get help. And your own town, I'm sure, if you're not in Newtown, is available to help too. John, do you have something? Yeah, if I could just formalize a, an idea that was brought up. Uh, in our neighborhood, there's uh, four houses 
uh, and I guess five if we consider one a, a couple blocks away, uh, that we shop for each other. So only one goes out at a time. So we get the list from everybody. Uh, so we'll do a big shop and then, you know, we'll call and see, well, what do you, do you need one or two things, you know? And then, you know, we do the small shops for everybody else and just check in. So we become our own resource. So we're not dependent on, well, it's nice to have a, a access to phone numbers and websites, but we start to gain control of our own immediate environment and our own lives. We strengthen our relationships with each other, surprise each other, and, uh, and we create a little network. Stephanie's Resilience Center is a perfect example of that. In a time of crisis, the, the, what the experts go to is they go to a, a pre-existing group, right? And so Stephanie created a group and then it became the Resiliency Center, became like the focal point, right? Mm -hmm. So creating little networks like that amongst yourselves within, within your own circle, that can become a, a resource for other people or it can grow to that. So I, I want people to think of resources not only as institutions and organizations or, or professionals, but they are their own resources and their networks are resources that they should value and try to strengthen. And that group brings up a great point. I always say to people, you know, we don't have to always turn to the therapist as a therapist to get the answers. We are all humans here. Relationships heal people. Andy, you making a call to somebody and having a relationship with them and check on or do a wellness call or tell a first responder or doctor how appreciative you are can have a bigger impact on their life and what they're going through at that point than picking up the phone maybe and having a one-on-one -on -one session as a therapist. And as society and as a town and a community, we're all capable and able to do that and have relationships that we can grow and help others. And I think that's really important for people to know and not fear, well, what if I call and they say something, I don't know how to react. Or what is their response gonna be? Relationships heal. And we should take all do our part in forming those relationships and all those connections. Stephanie, what's a, what, what's, we, you know, my, 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 my team in real estate, we're all, we're trying to check in with all of our past clients and our neighbors and things like that, just to check in and say, hi, it's not business related or anything. And then and inevitably our conversation of, well, what do we say always comes up, right? Like it's almost, we know we should check in. We know we should say hi. We should even just our neighbors, but you almost, I don't want to say it's embarrassment or it's something, right? But it's like, we're almost afraid to check in sometimes. Well, how do you, how do you start that? Does that make sense? Or am I just, am I the only one who feels that? It does. And I've been tasked with helping um, people call first responders to just let them know how appreciative they are, the elderly, veterans. So offline, I'm happy to share with you and your team a script that we've created. But a very general, this is simply a wellness call to see how you're doing, doing during this pandemic. Yeah. And just wanted to check in if you need anything and then give your staff some of the important phone numbers just in case somebody is feeling press that they get directed to a right person to help them navigate that or the Department of Health and right. yeah I think it's really important I'm just saying this is just a courtesy wellness check-in yeah it's great in, in uh, uh, in my practice um, you know not every uh, not everybody will call when they when they have a need but some people will so there's this uh, sometimes when you're hearing from people, uh, you might be getting a, an impression that, oh, people are doing all right, but it's the people you're not hearing about or hearing from that you worry about. So uh, on, on my, I've, I've been using Facebook. It, it's actually been kind of uh, effective. I'm, I have a, a Facebook page, John Woodall, MD. And, uh, uh, and also from my uh, electronic uh, health record, we send out texts to people and emails just to let them know that there's a new podcast on how to work with your kid during this issue, or you know, are, you know, these are issues that the elderly might be experiencing, or couples might be experiencing this kind of issue right now. And so it, it's it's information they can access without kind of exposing themselves to say, well, you know, I've got a problem with my spouse, or I'm getting depressed, or I'm getting anxious. Just putting the information up there so they can access it on their own mm -hmm. privately. Right. Right. I've got a, uh, a question. The um, uh, New York Life put out this grief coaching counseling service and, and one of the starting points is what not to say. Is that uh, 
because we're talking about all these well-meaning efforts uh, and I think just some great information and, and that I'm, I'm hearing here, but are there some things that you all as professionals would say, this is well-meaning, but this is taking you in a direction you don't want to go. And these I, are not I, good things to say. I do hear a lot, this too shall pass. <laughs> yes, this too shall pass. Yeah, yeah. However, there are people who are going to lose their jobs during this, and it's going to be really hard to recover from that. There are people who are going to suffer significant life changes right. that when the pandemic is over, they're still going to be really having a hard time. Mm -hmm. So people need to be mindful that everyone has a unique situation, and we may not know what that situation is. And for them, it might be really hard to recover to the new normal. This gets back to that idea about uh, capacities and vision. Um, if you've lost your job, uh, um, that's a huge blow to one's identity, huge blow. So the, 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 what, remember I mentioned that grief is a form of love and, and it, it, love has two, it, as an object, something you love and then you do the loving in different ways. You're patient, you're kind, you're industrious, you're persevering, you're, all these qualities are actually virgin, or you could, you could see them like as colors on the spectrum of love. You know? So here's a psychiatrist talking about love. But, uh, but really, if you help someone identify their strengths, what were the strengths they brought to their work? You reinforce their sense of value. Now they can find hopefully another place to, to direct those qualities. So the first task of grief is to talk about the strengths of the th uh, of that you were exhibiting in relationship to the thing you just lost. If it's a job, what were the skills you used? Uh, <clears throat> if it's a person whom you lost, it might be the opposite, where you focus on uh, their qualities and then decide, I'm going to keep their, their sense of humor alive in my life. I'm going to keep their loving kindness to even the most obnoxious person alive in my life, right? So it's again, it's a finding a way to keep the object of love alive in some new form. So anyway, I'll leave it at that. Guys, this was, um, I was trying to keep this right at kind of at our hour mark because um, people will have trouble watching this even beyond seven minutes and there's just so much great information in this. I want to thank you for your time, your expertise, Stephanie Sink, the Resiliency Center, John Woodall, Dr. John Woodall, wait, I would take me another hour to read your resume, Doc, and Sergeant Scott Ruzak from the Newtown PD. Guys, thank you so much for joining us. First Selectman Dan Rosenthal, Scott Anders from the Chamber. Guys, thank you. Uh, we're going to gauge um, what the response is to this recorded video. If there's a need, we'll come back to you and we'll try to do a live one again pending your schedules. But thank you for taking time out of your schedule, away from your lives and your families and whatever you're personally dealing with to share, um, man, just a wealth of knowledge. I sure will hope at least help one person out there. So thank you guys. Appreciate you. Thank you, thank you very thank much. You. Great yeah. job, Andy. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.